Welcome to another episode of Bringing Down the Grindhouse, a podcast where we discuss horror in media. And tonight, grab your tanned fuzzy coats, <laughs> grab your hook, and get your uh, razor blade laden candy, and kill some cops. <laughs> <laughs> As we dive into Candyman 2021. I'm Mitch. I'm Murr. I'm Justine. And I'm Jonathan. And I was not expecting cops to get killed yeah. in this movie, but it happened. It totally happened. Uh, that was the cherry on top. <laughs> that was <laughs> the cherry on top. Uh, also, bless. of course, seeing Tony Todd reprising his role was one of the coolest things. You know, I was going to say, and take on gentrification, but killing cops is kind of the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's part, oh my God. It's part of the process. It is a relevant topic. It actually is it's something relevant. that we'll have to talk about at yeah, some point. They are related, these things. So yeah. just off the top, it's directed by Nia DaCosta. She worked with Jordan Peele as well as Wynn Rosenfield to write the script. And so this has actually been taken up by Jordan Peele and his Monkey Paw Productions, so basically the production company that he owns. And he worked with Universal to get it distributed. And so he's been working on this for a long time and was kind of bringing her to the front. He's been doing a lot of things to like kind of bring forth black uh, directors and writers as well as other people of color. So this was like his way of giving someone else a chance. And I think he did really well. The The movie itself is 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 one of the better like spiritual successors or like a sequel yeah. to a movie. And really talk about giving uh, someone a, s- a chance. Go ahead. It's bitch. more, of, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> you. It's more of a, it's more of a sequel. I would right, say yeah. definitely like, so if you're going into this thinking, Oh, we're just going to get the Candyman story again. Yeah, well, a, you will, but it's a continuation. Yeah. It's of a the newer original. continuation, which is really cool. I liked the idea that they came up with and showing part of the history. Um, you know, as far as Nia DaCosta, though, this is, while it's not like her official debut into film, she had made one film before this. This is like her first mainstream film. So and it got taken cool up by a big production. Put on such a big platform at such a young age. She's what? Like she's 31. 30. She's so 31. She she's... got to, uh, she got offered to direct um, the next uh, Captain Marvel movie. And it was because of this movie, because of the success of this movie. And so when she does direct that, she's going to be the youngest director ever to direct a Marvel movie. Yeah. We just got back from seeing this in the theater too, <laughs> yeah. which is Dropped awesome. Today. Literally watched yeah. it like a few, I don't know, like an hour or two ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, noting that we actually don't know how well it did in the box office because it literally just came out, but it had a budget of twenty five million, so pretty big for a movie like this and for for a director that they don't know is going to do well. This is like her her second or third film. It's currently certified fresh. Also certified yeah, fresh. It got I a mean, lot of reviews because there's a lot of uh, fanatics for people who love Candyman. This is like I a cult it was classic. Pretty fresh. Yeah, it's. A, I would have given it a higher rating, honestly. Yeah. I would. I went into the '90s for it because I liked it so much. Um, this stars. Uh, I don't know how to say the name. Can you say the name? Why are you asking me? Because you're black. <laughs> you know, I give it a try. All right, I his name see is. Try. <laughs> his name is Yaya Abdul Mateen the uh, second. Tayana Paris, Nathan Stewart Jarrett, Coleman Domingo, and Tony Todd, of course. And so these are going to be your main characters and you're going to find out that uh, there's kind of more to the Candyman story and you find out through like the main d- people who are in it. Oh, yes. I'm a whore for lore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like that should be Insane, a new saying. Though. Yeah. yeah. I, also a whore for lore. I actually stole it from a YouTuber. Oh, damn. <laughs> but it's they, still they, beautiful. They make Sims videos. Look up Plumbella if well, you like Sims. I thought you came up with that like off the top of your nah, head right I'm, now. I'm really... I wish. I'm really happy that they brought back the origin story because that's only Same. in the second and third movie that they explain that shit. Yeah, you don't really get a clear explanation of it in, and in that first movie. Most one. people just watch the first movie because the right. other ones are not as good is what they say. Well, notoriously, sequels are just not very yeah. good. And so in this case, you have one that is really good because I think they waited enough time to, almost, to make almost it. Almost whole 20 years. No, it's like they, 30 years. They yeah. showed good respect to the source material also, of the first yeah, movie. So it definitely. really... It was a very good segue into the rest of the story for sure. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with Tony Todd as well. He was offered to make a new Candyman movie like several times and refused because he didn't think it was either the right time or the right content. Like at some point they wanted to make a movie where the leprechaun fights him. 
fights Candyman in okay. a movie. No, but and it was I would have like, paid big money to see that. It would have been <laughs> hilarious, but I don't think it would have been. Yeah, it wouldn't have mixed well. It wouldn't. It w- I don't think it would have captured the themes. Yeah. that are present in the first movie because the first movie, especially for that time period, yeah, it's talking about some big shit. Yeah, and then you have fucking Leprechaun yeah. with uh, Which what's is, the girl it, from Friends? Um, who cares? Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> She's in that like really young. It was weird. <laughs> anyway, he turned down a whole bunch, and then he eventually found out that Jordan Peele was interested in making a new movie, and pretty much gave it his blessing, regardless of whether or not he was going to be in the film or not. And I think Jordan Peele is perfect for this because I yeah. feel like Candyman has very political undertones, and oh, overtones, yeah. um, overtones, <laughs> and I feel like Jordan Peele does a really good job about intertwining his scripts and his themes and his ideas in a way that's tasteful you the know? three writers for it which include jordan peele nia da costa and then you have um i think it was uh rosenfield win rosenfield they all those three are like the perfect ones to write this story together and it's really cool when people come collaboratively to write something you get with whenever peel works on something with other especially people. with these with these other people as well you're getting a really good mix of dark kills really funny as fuck kills and also some really just interestingly shot ones as well. Right. Uh, he played with paranoia really, or they rather the, the group of them uh, paid uh, played very well with paranoia, similar to like how um, it follows does because every time there's a oh, mirror yeah. in, the, in the film, you're like, Holy shit, he's gonna be in the fucking mirror. He's gonna Ooh. be in the fight. You're always checking the mirrors and shit. Can we please talk about perspective on the kills too? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that's what I've never about. seen. Definitely. Well, I've seen it before, but I haven't seen very many like far away shot kills. Like that one art critic. Oh, with the critic that dies yeah. in her apartment. As you're panning out away from the apartment, you see her. Like, you could rise almost into the miss air. it if you don't yeah, look directly you, in the middle. You can see into the windows of all the apartments. Yeah. So you just happen to maybe notice that. Then one. you see her blood smeared all over Dude, the he, window. Uh, and dragged her face across yeah. the yeah. entire length of the fucking window <laughs> before dropping her and you're just like, oh fuck but I mean you know you didn't really like her anyway <laughs> she, she was a snobby she bitch she was very you know, snobby you, one of my I think my favorite scene though was with the hand mirror in the girl's bathroom yes um, this, is, this is really good because you don't even really yeah. see it until you uh, no. see it um yeah. someone actually commented on that so uh so roger ebert uh, there's a roger ebert site where people go and write reviews for it and so uh, Odie henderson wrote the review that says uh costa's visual style writing that she stages the kill scenes with a mix of pitch black humor misdirection and clever framing fully acknowledging that what you don't see or think you saw can be a lot worse than what you did see that fear of the unknown shit <laughs> also is so real which we've discussed before a lot many many times but it's very effective in horror in general that just makes me think of the one thing like how this movie started already sort of put me on edge when yeah we already all have all of the um you know you show the production companies that made the film at the very start all of their logos were flipped in reverse Ooh, and so yeah. i was like is this a mistake like is something wrong and then i was sort of sitting there waiting to figure out if what i was seeing was what i was supposed to be seeing yeah. And then eventually you figure out that they did that purposefully, but that already sort of sets the anxious tone for the rest of the movie. Yeah, they they throw you off right at the beginning, and I had well, what what did you think the reason was for it? Because you mentioned something about the mirrors. Well, yeah, they talk a lot about mirrors and how basically he sort of exists in this alternate space. You know, and so automatically you have things flipped in the beginning, putting you in the mirror. And then as you come into view of the movie, you're looking into a boy's mirror and then you pan out and you're looking back to the mirror. So you're like in the mirror, in this alternate world automatically. I recently got a shirt for like Candyman, the original 1992 version. And I looked at it. I'm like, they printed this thing fucking backwards, dude. Oh, that's I was dope. so pissed. I was like, oh, time to take a mirror selfie. And I was like, and it oh, turns out <laughs> they're fucking geniuses, yeah. dude. I was like, oh my God. That's clever so, marketing. So when they did the, the thing, I was just like, oh, that's cute. They really, they like called back to it. But then I was like, oh, they're going to do it for all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I had taken it as one like what justine had said about the mirror but also that in a way we were sort of becoming a part of the story too because the main theme of the Candyman story was that as soon as people figured out about him they start talking more about him the chances of him killing you got like exponentially higher and so you then got brought into the story and then got into that cycle of what ends up being that story even if it's willingly or exactly they're unwillingly taking you into the story because now you know about him 
it's yeah. that meta meta shit it's like that that general meta, vibe meta. and this is what yeah. a lot of good horror movies do is yeah. they kind of sit there for a little bit and kind of meander around the characters and establish yeah. all of them and everything uh but it really captured the vibe of the of the 92 version as well because it's just sort of like okay so you're gonna meet who the people are who are involved and then you're gonna get the legend yeah and then I like how they establish it where it's the it's the um, the one friend or it's it's her brother. It's her brother, yeah. It's who the tells the story? Uh, I'm glad they didn't waste any time. Yeah. The script I think was well paced. Um, I didn't think it was rushed because I I already wanted to get into the story. That's what everyone felt about the story. We know the story of Candy Man, so we're like, what is this? What's the new story? And so then you kind of get like immediately into the fact that he's like basically changing into him, and you get a really cool like change and progression of him and then i think you mentioned it while we were watching it uh it seems that all of the people who play candy man or who turned into him they're all painters yeah yeah, yeah. they're or like artists this ended up sense. they were an artist and then the critic even comments about how artists are sort of contributing in some way to the gentrification like that was her snide remark yeah. to him oh and my so God. you then have well you would mistake it for racism to start but then you find out that she's just being condescending and you're like i don't know I which mean, one's probably worse. a little racist <laughs> right but- Definitely she says, well, cause... you're kind or yeah. like that. And I was just like, oh, fuck. I know, you they, can hear. They, yeah. they do the this whole, multiple times in the movie. The whole theater murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> yeah, we were really, like, a lot of people do that. They did a really good job of getting the idea of microaggressions down. Like, how oh, yeah. people will say things to you that are sort of a backhanded thing that you're uh, like, are you commenting on like a certain piece of like my own heritage while also giving you a compliment. That's another thing I just thought about is microaggressions because I feel like sort of a a running theme in this movie was that this guy was aware of something happening, but people kind of didn't really believe him because it was just like these little things. And a lot of times I find that when I'm experiencing aggression from somebody in the form of microaggressions, they're so small that if you tell somebody, they're just going to be like, oh, like you're kind of crazy. Like, I'm sure nothing actually happened. I'm sure they didn't mean it that way. I mean, this is this is definitely one of. I'm just mentioning, like, this is one of Peel's strong suits that we see through um, Get Out, and that we also saw in Us a little bit as well, if I remember correctly. Us was a lot more cerebral and a lot more abstract, I think, in what it was right. portraying. Um, but especially in in uh, Get Out, a lot we saw a lot of that similar things, and I think he does really well at portraying those very accurately. You know, I saw. I saw Virginia Madsen and fucking Anthony, dude. I saw her, I saw her coming out in him, just like because he has the camera in the beginning of the movie, and he's like trying to like uncover this hidden legend. I think one of my favorite characters is the the laundromat owner. Like, yeah, Hell like yeah. for sure. Like you you feel a connection to him from like the old movie, um, even though he was just a, a passerby in Cabrini Green, which is like what is it? it's like a very low income housing i don't know i feel like him being there was almost like prophesized because you know that this main character i believe he was the baby yeah that was brought That's, to the fire in the yeah, first story you, you discover that there's more to the origin story and that he's a he's a lot closer to it than you originally and then thought. you have this guy who just happens to be at the same place he is and tells him all about Candyman. This guy starts to go crazy and is painting him everywhere and is just obsessed with learning more about the story. And in the end, this man turns him into Candyman pretty yeah. much. He gives him the hook and the jacket. Right. And, and he says that uh, because of like the the way that gentrification has happened in those areas, there is a need for a Candyman. There's a need for people to be afraid of these legends. So Yeah. He has a really strong moment when he's talking to him in the laundromat when Anthony is like freaked out and goes and talks to him that one night and he tells him, uh, it's not one person. It, this is like how we deal with the cyclical nature of violence happening in yeah. our communities. And it this is what it turns into, that. turned into this entity yeah. that then haunts not only us, but everyone around us and sort of ends up being, but then it like changes. It changes at the end because it sort of turns into something that protects. He straight up protects his girlfriend. Like, even though she's the one who summoned him, he doesn't kill her. Yeah. yeah. And so I mean, then he was given sort of like directives before he was transformed right. into Candyman. He was told that this is what Candyman is for. And he like understood. Like, oh, that's a job, good point. You know, he, it could be that while people while this is happening, it is possible to sort of like set rules that he's supposed to follow. And in this case, he is meant to take like kind of take care of people who obviously yeah. are not good people because the the essence of Candyman is kind of ritualistic you know you go right. into the mirror say his name five times and he appears i mean what else do you know about that like bloody mary that's <laughs> like a fun yeah, exactly. ritual game people like to do and so in this case he just took it a step further 
took his hand, gave him the hook, gave him the coat, and gave him his directives. And, and he then had, he was oh. shot down and resummoned as Candyman, who was that this was now like, like neighborhood yeah. vigilante dude. That struck me like really hard. I was like, oh, would well, this got like really close to home all of a sudden yeah. when like you see him just get immediately shot like no questions asked i thought the chick got shot also. i thought i, I thought, thought so they both too. did yeah and i was like oh fuck. and then that chilling moment when she's in the car with the detective or whatever and he's like okay so here's the two stories you can go with right. neither of them are close to the truth but no. one gives her a little bit of a better life <laughs> i think one of the most clever things uh with this is that all the lore is depicted through puppetry oh, yeah. and it's so and good amazing puppetry work i need to figure out who did that because they i need to give them props for it's everything. it's got to be one of the production designers who's on the film like them and probably a team because like you just don't of, see uh, this kind of stuff and maybe think of harry potter in the oh yeah that's a good point what was the last one the half blood no the the deadly hollows deathly hollows, deathly mm. hollows. oh my god it's been years <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had, you know, the moment where they're explaining who death was and yes. how he made the oh yeah, that's right, the horcruxes, the shroud, and all the other stuff, and the wand, and then the stone, mm -hmm. and that was done through puppetry as well, or some yeah. something similar to it. Which um, is like the only other time I've seen it done like really well. Um, I can't think of any others uh, when they did something like that. Uh, it always ends up being something that works really well because it reverts to sort of like the simplest form of storytelling. Didn't they do that right. in The Babadook? They did they it did. in The Babadook, yeah. you're right. Well, they did it through sort of like a, a picture book. Yeah, a pop-up book. A it's pop -up a little book. bit different, but they you still um, have this paper figures. Something about that, though, really gets people. Like when you sort of show something that can easily be shown to like children and the fact that it's so dark kind of fucks yeah, with you so I mean, a cynical. lot of children's stories are dark when you get yeah to the essence of that's them. true actually there's a lot of them this makes me think of like the ring around the rosie song oh, yeah. which is literally talking about like the black death <laughs> and i mean all of the disney princess stories are also disneyfied like significantly like sleeping beauty yeah the real story of sleeping beauty is fucking up. terrible look it up anyways also the hunchback of notre dame is also yeah. a terrible story I would like to say my favorite piece of puppetry was when uh, they explain the origin of Candyman, and they say that a lynch mob is going to yeah because uh, because you know it's told he was a painter, fell in love with a rich uh, white woman, and got she her. She fell in love with him. Oh, yep, that's actually what happened. <laughs> yeah, I they think fell I, in love. I think they fell in love with each other. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. like a so one-sided thing. <laughs> he got her pregnant. Therefore, they sent a lynch mob at him. Yeah. But right when that happens, they cut back to Anthony, and there's a siren that goes right past. So, so it kind of just shows you the different generation of Ooh. what a lynch mob was. Yeah, the lynch like mob that. is no longer a bunch of town villagers. It's, it's the, the boys in blue with their badges and their bright lights on their car. Yeah. yeah. That's they're, the real lynch mob And their tasers today. that just look like guns. But and their guns <laughs> that are actual guns. Yeah, right. Um, what the so and their fucking knees, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think about when he was visiting the library and he's listening to what the original woman had to say about why Candyman was created in the first place. That was actually like a really good audio bit to include at that moment. Oh, with Virginia Madsen. Yeah, where she's talking about how it was sort of a necessity to create this sort of urban legend around this area. And then they even comment like on it with later. the fact that all that violence is happening in the exactly. city. Exactly. And then uh, I think I think it's his girlfriend who mentions that, uh, you know, it was certain people who had made the the projects, who had made the ghetto there, and then they wanted to get rid of it this, because they had made the ghetto. And it's like they didn't, like, it was sort of a thing that they wanted to cover up and change. So then, yeah. you, of course, you gentrify it. And so that was one of the, that was like the biggest overtone for all of it. And then underneath that, you have a lot of different layers of what they're talking about, mm -hmm. which includes, you know, how people are dealing with the, like their lives within this community. And then, so you have all these I kind mean, of unfold for you. The laundromat owner even says like, you have tons of people dying in these streets that are black, but as soon as one white woman dies, <laughs> the story then, it, lives ma on then it makes a fucking story. Yeah. yeah that story kind of keeps getting told and it, the story is not even told correctly. No, they're told that she kidnapped the baby went crazy she, she and tried to dog. burn it when it's the opposite yeah. that she had actually saved the baby. And then of course you have the nice tie in where he's the baby, where Anthony's the baby. And then he's sort of destined to be the new candy man. And so you have this sort of repeating thing that keeps happening throughout the film. And you don't realize it at first until <laughs> you get all the way to the end and they do the puppetry scene and you realize, Oh, candy man's a repeating thing. Yeah. It always has to be a certain situation or circumstances that happen. It's very it's very smart because they, they describe three different names of people from past generations, eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, two thousands and all that. Anthony is just the new newest candy man. Even so that she practices it 
on the cop who is trying to persuade her to, yeah, to say the wrong narrative. Yeah, she immediately knows that she could do it. And I think she took a risk. I think she kind of knew that there was a possibility that she might die and wanted to do it anyway. I mean, I feel like at that point, dying is better than the options she was given. Right. And so she either lives with the guilt of pinning this sort of persona slash crime on these two men, or she goes to jail for the rest of her life. The fourth time that she says Candyman, she's smiling. Right. She starts to smile. So she's just like, even if I die after this, all these motherfuckers are going down. Yeah, they're all going to die. It's going to be sick as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my, favorite part, my favorite part with that, too, is the cop goes, Candyman? Question mark? And she's like, oh, he did it for me. Uh, yeah, also. Yeah. Ooh, oh, wait. So this made me think, too, is that technically speaking, I wonder if there is rules saying, like, whoever says the last one may be the one who gets killed. Yeah, because she only said it four times. Yeah. And also, I think it happens earlier in the film where someone only says it a certain amount of times and then someone else says it. And then you have the, you know, the, him coming in to kill people. So oh, it's like, there are so many fucking things with, I mean, yeah. with, the, uh, with the explanation they go into in the story. I know that we wanted to, at least while we were watching it, like um, some, some people, I know John, you were saying this um, that you wanted to get right into the, the right. grit of the story instead of getting the backstory on it. But I think there are plenty of younger people now who have never seen. Yeah, they don't know what it is. Oh, gee, candy man. And now, like, this kind of is a good segue for them to kind of get in the story. Yeah. They do it fairly briefly, and they give you just enough so that you know what's going on. And then all the sh- – I mean, the callbacks to the original are wonderful also, exactly, because they're related. But I, I, I loved hearing that. So you have, like, the old recordings and stuff. You have um, – That is, like, one of the best ways to include something that was made previously yeah. is to get the actual audio. Or to get something that happened before, and so in this way, they're doing, they're paying a lot of respect to the original content while also making this new piece of it oh, and shit, adding she on really to it. That, dog. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny though. That one made me laugh. There was there was a lot of humor tied into it, and it was at really good opportune moments that like kind of caught you off guard. And it's like you would have a moment like when she goes into the laundry room, and like there's a dark stairway down and then she opens the door and goes nope and just oh closes it <laughs> Yo, there were straight up like favorite. people fucking cheering for that shit yeah because it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the opposite of what you see in horror film you know you've got you got these people who are like oh wow scary basement let me go take a look what's you down know, here i just love how many jokes have been made about horror movies and they're like black people would never yes like there's that one line where they're talking about summoning candy man and uh the one character was like oh no black people don't summon nothing <laughs> like, oh yeah no, we, do we don't have any business summoning uh, <laughs> oh my god but it's true like if you don't know what you're summoning don't summon it hey. it's, it's it's true okay if you see a dark stairway and things are already kind of creepy don't go down it hey props to the one chick in high school who was just like ran i out. ain't doing this shit she said I not know, today like, and out. ran out <laughs> i'm pretty sure she was like the one asian girl yes. out of the group too asian people know too yeah. don't fuck with that not shit. today no oh, but uh, poor girl who was in the stall who just gets traumatized i know <laughs> she already looked moment. like she was having some sort yeah of she's panic getting attack. bullied by these and girls she's also getting bullied by them she's just fucked up so not hey, having a and good now day. she's potentially an accomplice to murder also oh. yeah because yeah. it's like what happened i mean you were in there didn't you see anything i You're think like, that I, was i don't know what i saw i think that was part of the point though is that they wanted to create a possibility of the story being misinterpreted again like they had multiple moments of where people do not understand what truly happened in the story. Like even when um, Anthony's at the critic's house yeah. and he knows that he's there, he's like, I got to go. Cause he's well, also, he, like, he might be blamed for that. And whoever survives usually is the one who gets blamed. I mean, Anthony was blamed right. for all of the murders cause they were related to the painting that he, uh, yeah released or the the series of paintings that he made a bit and, of dark um, comedy when he's just like they said my name that happened throughout <laughs> with uh, the candy man stories you have yeah. the uh 80s slash 90s candy man where they thought that he was putting razor blades in candy when it turned out it wasn't him but he was still blamed for it because he happened to be close to what the crime was you know dude that one hurt because he was just a old man trying to give people candy yeah yeah so the, it turns out that he's actually harmless but then it makes you wonder where the hell did the razor blades come from right in this candy because it happened multiple times yeah so it's like you know who was actually doing that and why did it end up happening there but what what you guys made me think of was uh you had mentioned it right at the beginning is they had really clever framing of what you're looking at multiple views views through a mirror they use the mirror like reflection off of something else so you never got to really see Candyman directly until the very end it's technically invisible yeah technically invisible so it makes you wonder how she was able to see him at the end 
Well, only oh, the summoner is able to see this, them. It could be that too. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that the original is also a little different because they have some more uh, practical effects in it. Yeah, things like that too. Like my one complaint is there was no bloody rib cage. Yeah, he didn't open up his oh, shirt or vest yeah, to see exactly. everything. Exactly, and I was like, I was like, come on, that's like one of the things that made that character so like 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 kind of terrifying as well because you're like this is like a some strange, I don't know, bizarre. End yeah. Case they handled deal. violence in a weird way. At least I thought so. Like the beginning, you sort of get like a, a non-direct view of what's happening. Yeah. And then, then, then you get up right to the end where he just saws his arm off, like no warning, oh, God, that like was really brutal. unceremoniously cuts off his arm. And you're just like, Oh, he, he's going he, for evil it. Evil dead dude. His ass. Like just fuck. <laughs> and then just shoves the fucking hook into okay, his there. arm. And you're just like, Oh my you God. See these silent tears come from his eyes. Yeah, he doesn't even like freak out. No, it doesn't flinch. Yeah, so you know, he's like, what's supposed okay. to happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> this was something I actually really enjoyed about this film because I'm not one for gore, especially movies that are just all gore. Like that's the whole point of it. But this movie had a nice blend of like really gross, gory yep. scenes as well as a lot of psychological horror. Yeah, the things that you thought you saw reflections of things double like you check yourself and be like no i didn't actually see something and then he looks again and it's there he's standing behind him he's standing behind the woman the critic he's like he always shows up he showed up so fast in the movie like literally like i don't know 10 15 minutes in you see him already yeah. in the mirror and then you're just waiting to see him wherever else he shows up i think they they play with the um the summoning a lot more in this film than yeah. the original one too so and that was really good too because that kind of like uh, cements it a lot more yeah it solidifies the lore that's sort of established throughout the movie about who and what Candyman is. Right. I To me, that sort of felt like they were uh, pressing home the point that uh, the violence that happens to anybody who summons him, it doesn't matter who it is. If you're within the area and you have these certain things happen to you, then you'll get killed all the same. And so this is, they're making a point of like, you know, even the people who are trying to assist and enter into say like the ghetto area or the projects are trying to help. Oftentimes they may be part of the violence that happens there. And In so they're, a lot of cases, and yeah. Yeah, they're making a point to be like, even the allies of people who are assisting here are, are going to be brought into this violence. And then anyone else who looks in and sees it, it's a misinterpretation no matter what you're looking at. Cause they don't know what actually happened. And so they keep doing this over and over again. And that's sort of the, the theme that they run with, and sort of their way of like tying it into whatever's happening now, like sort of a modern take on it. But that it, they didn't, I don't think they pushed past the point of it being like, this is too obvious. Like this is too on the nose for things. And they even made a joke on themselves where they, yeah. where the critic comments about the artists being the ones that may be possibly um, feeding into the gentrification that happens because of their artwork, because of what they represent. I mean, yeah. just look at, the neighborhood that we're in right now, mm. uh, North Park, is like a big arts community. And uh, not too long ago, you know, it was just sort of like a bunch of shops and houses. It was more of a low income area. And since all of these art studios and breweries and whatnot, little knickknack shops have started popping up, suddenly the rent starts to go up. They pay more attention to the streets and clean them up and make them look all nice and pretty. And then you have all these white people start to move in in um, the ones to like predominantly yeah. POC area. Then, then you need cops to patrol the area, yeah, right? You have more cops that are coming through. Yeah, patrol the area. They got to keep you in. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. was the, that the, was one the, the big lines. one. Also, they'll promise you a Whole Foods eventually. God, that was okay. So there is a Whole Foods down the street. <laughs> there really is a Whole Foods down the street from here. Um, he kind of took back a moment from her when he was just like, "Oh, well, you're suddenly interested in my work." And they made a they made a point too to show it with his girlfriend, where a lot of the times people are brought into certain situations because of their connection to things that have happened to them, and they are no longer doing it on their merit, but on the things that have happened to them. It's interesting that she becomes interested in his work as soon as a couple of white people die. Yeah, around his artwork. So exactly. That's a back to that joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they joke. all. Yep. She's they like, definitely. Oh, do. it's so morbid. <laughs> Oh, she uh, says, this will sell for sure. <laughs> oh God! What, she says she says it's macabre, and that is it. What did yeah. she say? It ends up being something that's like real, like or something that like uh, she can feel. It's like contemporary or something like that. And you're just like, ooh. Yeah, I've always felt like that's sort of a lot of people's appeal to understanding what it's like to grow up in these sort of neighborhoods is like trying to understand the violence that you don't grow up with, and then to see two white folks experience the violence that well maybe not in that 
manner per se but still experiencing violence it makes it become much more um, tangible um also it should be noted that his girlfriend doesn't really seem to have a huge response to it and so in a way she's almost be- been like uh like desensitized yeah. to what's been happening even though she had like an obviously traumatic event happen when she was younger <laughs> yeah. in, in the form of her dad just jumping off the fucking top floor of their house yeah and killing himself yeah, I mean that. I mean, seeing that probably pushed her away from that community in the first place. She's like, "Well, I need to do something better. I can't That's be true. involved in because her father was also an artist." Yeah. So it's kind of like a, I need to kind of push myself away. Yet she's still drawn to it. Yeah. In a sense, probably like if you wanted to psychoanalyze this, it could be like I wanted to be closer to what my father was a part of, but I also want to be separate from my part. Father well, she ended up so finding a partner who's just like her dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just yeah. like you end up having that that thing that people always mention where you're sort of looking for these things in people. And so in this case, the same thing happens. It also makes you think about the lore of it where she was almost meant to be drawn to somebody like in another time. I bet her dad would have fit right into the role of being Candyman. But in this case, it was her boyfriend. And it's just because of those circumstances. I'm just thinking about all the shade that that one chick threw at her. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah you're, a tor- you're a tortured past, you know? Oh, my. Oh, the uh, fucking curator. Yeah, was, at the museum. Yeah. Oh, my God. She was basically being like, oh, you're you. We need to have you here because of what's happened to you. And it's no longer about her merit. Like, she's not a good curator. She's not a good like what at her job. Yeah. It's because of what's happened. Yeah. You poor thing oh, is essentially what it, what in turned a lot into. Of cases, you this is what You're makes so certain artists you. become famous. Right. Like here's a classic example is Van Gogh. No oh, one gave a yeah. shit about Van he Gogh. He was poor. <laughs> like his paintings did not sell and eventually he killed himself and it wasn't until after or he died. I can't remember if he killed himself or he died because I remember something sure about eating himself. lead paint. Made him go crazy. I can't remember. But anyways. Cut off his ear, sent it to his yeah. lost love. But uh, after he had died, then his paintings start to blow up because now you have this really sad backstory of this tortured man gone insane. But look at this great artwork he did. Yep. <laughs> July. Wait. Yeah. On July 27th, 1890, in a field near Avaris, Vincent shot himself in the chest with a revolver. Shit. He died two days later with his brother Theo at his bedside. Damn. You know... It's not related at all, but I watched a long time ago a Doctor Who episode where, like, oh man, v- like she uh, takes the Van Gogh one. Yeah, she takes yeah. Vincent Van Gogh yeah, to go see me that cry shit. That and then was like, she's like, my paintings record. don't sell. I suck. And she's like, well, look. And it's, he's in a museum. She's showing off his works, and like, probably changed history a little bit. But you know, yeah. it was hard to watch that scene. Yeah. It was really hard. But it made me just... cry. <laughs> This movie exemplified how a lot of artists don't really matter until you have that backstory behind their art. It's so, or at it's, least behind the person making it. I mean, it talks a lot about like the tortured soul of an artist. I mean, think about it. All the candy men were artists. Okay, but am I the only one? So this is this might people might get upset about it, but Anthony's artwork, his his initial artwork, it kind of sucked. Yeah. Like looking at it, I was like, this isn't really that good. Like, oh, which one? The first one? Well, the stuff on the wall. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if all of it was his, but like the stuff on the wall and then like that first one he does, I'm like, this is pretty bad. Like, I, if I was like somebody who was going to curate a show, I'd be like, ooh, I don't know about that one. But then the ones he makes after oh, are yeah. fucked up. They're, these are like some like really morbid, yeah. like austere things that you're looking at and you're just like, oh, this is like what you'd want to put up. And, and I don't know if it was just me, but I was like, I, I No, I felt the same agree. way. I felt the paintings that he made when he was like descending into his madness are fucking brilliant. Yeah, they were but fucked up. But the first up. ones are like some weird like pop art kind of half Yeah. Like, it looks hey. like when you use like stencils and stuff like, yeah. to make something. It looked like something like a, a middle schooler would make for their art show. I think I'm just <laughs> a fan of when people do paintings that have the like the obvious uh like texture on it yeah and you see from like the brush strokes and like so much paint being put onto it yeah you just see that david cho style oh yeah, yeah. That's, usually, that's a good point yeah so even though it's not his style but i recognize you it know <laughs> as david cho's style uh, welcome to art critique with the grindhouse <laughs> yeah honestly yeah <laughs> and someone's gonna be like no it's from the 1600s and you're uncultured and <laughs> then i'll tell them do your off. research you sound stoned and uneducated uh, anyone remember that comment hey truth be told we are stoned and uneducated no, oh my god <laughs> That was great. No, we're just stone, but we're educated. All Slightly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, half of us are. Mr. Ah, Degree Man, kidding. tell me good things. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm criticizing artwork. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, no, there's there's that's a, what we're doing right now. There's that one painting where it's like half of Tony Todd's face and half of Anthony's oh, face, so more, like morphed into each other. Yeah. So so while you're si- while you're talking about this, we we have to talk about what did you guys think about his transformation? It was Do you think cool. it was well done? Like, cause the fucking him picking at his skin on his arm fucks me up. Uh, like him, like yeah. literally pulling some skin off, and he's like deteriorating basically. I love how it starts with the bee sting. Also yeah. starts with the bee sting, which you think is not really going to be a big thing, but I guess if you're like if you know that bees are sort of connected with him, you're like, oh, this is not going to be good. I kind of like that it came from a bee sting because I feel like the whole him transforming into Candyman was sort of like the bug thing, the allusion to metamorphosis. A lot of bugs go Ooh, through like a major that's change. That's a good one. They go from little goopy larva to whatever sort of bug they turn into, whether it's a, a hornet, a bee, a butterfly, anything like that. Shed but you see, skin. yeah, he starts to shed his skin, but he's also growing this new thing underneath his skin. And then you see his torso and it's all porous but it also kind of looked like a honeycomb yeah i was yeah. gonna say that There's he looked the, like he could have bees inside of him the allusion to the hive that candy man is essentially like a hive mind since there's Collection so many things, different yeah. souls that are contributing to it but it's all under the same spirit you know this calls back to his mother because she's like yes there was an unwritten code and i guess someone broke it and that was you yeah, it was yeah just basically fucked. basically uh, it sucks that it ends up being him because yeah. he, he, he so if he had never mentioned it, he would have been fine. <laughs> like he would have never. Oh, actually, who who was it that brought it up? It was the laundry mat owner. Oh, yeah, that's right. He specifically told him, and so in a way, it's like really purposeful because yep. he's like he knew from the start that he was gonna turn him in to to, to the new candy man. So you're just like, oh, he's like he's already fucking crazy. <laughs> and so you then have this whole transformation happen. So then, uh, do you guys think it ended well? Like, is it left kind of open? Like, is this another cycle? His deep voice monologue before killing cops, oh, I love dude. It. Mm. it sent chills. I was so he's happy. Like, he's like, they're going to say that they killed innocent people, that we spilled the blood of innocent people, but these people are far from innocent. I thought he was going to say the actual quote from the beginning yeah. of the first movie. I thought so, too. But I was like, no, he's doing his own thing. This is so sick. Then she finally sees him, the Tony Todd version, and he's like, I want you to tell everyone. <laughs> like, everyone needs to know who Candyman is, and it's such a great line for him at the end. I thought that was interesting, because it kind of further feeds into the idea that Candyman is this sort of entity thing. Because yeah. in a lot of cases, when you are thinking about an entity and you are calling upon it, you give it more power. And so yep. he's essentially wanting to get more power so he can do more you know more people are calling upon him he's able to enact his vengeance oh yeah even you. by having the movie come out yeah you're sort of having that a resurgence this entire time because we talked about that with the wenda bagels yeah. yeah oh my god we saw the preview for oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. it looks disturbing and i'm excited i'm, I'm really <laughs> Yo, did you get a it. glimpse of that fucking creature the, darn oh, oh, God. Or the corpse and the twisting corpse. yeah oh, it i can't believe like, they showed yeah. that in yeah, the preview so. my the preview is brutal <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought yeah imagine how the rest of the movie Ooh, is oh, but God. still that that uh even in the trailer of the antlers I thought this was just a myth. Yeah, to you. Yeah. That so was that good. even calls back to now with Candyman. Um, I couldn't tell in the preview if it was like if they were just speaking a different language, but it sounded like native people from Native America speaking like their language over the preview. Yeah. I and it like that. and it gets more like faster as it's going. And I was like, this is really unsettling. Yeah. It's cool that they added that element in because I feel like that often gets lost in these Wendy Bagel stories is the <laughs> fact that like the natives to the land knew about these things for years, hundreds of years, maybe. They know how to deal with it. They know what to call it. They know where it comes from. All right. And I'm glad they actually incorporated that because a lot of these folks that have colonize those areas don't really know what these things are i'm until so they glad learn it's somebody. uh guillermo lo toro yeah doing the story because i know he's like basically like proved himself to be a really really good interpreter of stories and to make it like really good for the screen so did you guys have any favorite parts or your favorite scene from this movie 
Go for the it. The bathroom scene with all the high school girls. Yeah. Uh, that shit was uh, lit. <laughs> hey, these are very believable high school girls. I will give yeah. that. Also, yeah, it didn't just, seem I like... I gotta go grab my vape. Like, I was like, oh, okay. shit. So funny. <laughs> They're very believable for this day and age. That's what like, I'm saying. They don't look like high school girls from the fucking early 2000s. You all know what those look like. Everyone knows what that looks like. These look like real high school <laughs> They're like, don't be a pussy. I know it's warm and, like, strong and powerful. <laughs> Why I was not? like... This is like so modernized. It like uh, I was like, yeah. dang, they actually got like they funny. got that pretty well. But the the scene where like you see the blood just burr, oh. that it, it was like I don't know, it was just oh dripping the very slowly. Fall. Whoever did the sound design <laughs> is fucked up because they gave you disturbing sounds while you're listening. God, to this the song. sound effects while the dude's getting his fucking hand sawed off. That oh, sent me. oh <laughs> my god. You gotta give props to the Foley guy. Yeah, the holy Foley shit. The guy gets an A plus, 10 out of 10. Oh my god, he's like sawing through a carrot or something. <laughs> to make the sound. Like, I think for like breaking bones and stuff, they'll take, they'll take, uh, they will take, um, celery. Celery, yeah. Like, <laughs> twist it in front of the mic because so it just creates that. Like shove some celery and yeah, some meat. They'll and get a few kinda... stalks of celery and snap it. Uh, okay, I, I think my favorite scene from the movie was uh, the art critic getting killed in her apartment. I Brutal. just love that moment so much. How it's so subtle, but like, oh, when you see it, you see it. And it's, it's, it's really unsettling. This whole movie is unsettling. But that's just one of the many things that makes it so unsettling is sort of this unknown, but also this like distance from knowing what's really happening. Because, you know, you can't see her face. You can't see anything else that's happening. You just know it's happening. They did a good job of not using your typical jump scare tactics that they use in horror yeah. films. And instead went with the idea that they were not going to prep you at all. They were just going to go right into whatever violence happens, and then you're shocked either by what you're seeing or what you're hearing. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I agree. Uh, <laughs> high, and I liked that a lot about yeah, this movie. Yeah, it works no really well. Loud noise, jump scare bullshit, which takes me out of movies usually. The only that. thing that was sort of a loud scare was the gunshots at the end, but yeah. I think that was also purposeful. Right. I think my favorite scene is uh, when the laundromat owner is in the church. Ooh. And you see, like, Sweets for the Soul or whatever it says. Yeah. Um, and he goes, you could change the myth however you want, but some things have to stay the same as he takes the hook out and everything. Yeah, which is also giving you the idea that, like, oh, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, they've changed sort of the lore and the mythos of, of what Candyman is. I don't know the name of the actor. I swear I've heard his voice somewhere before. The laundromat guy? The laundromat yeah. guy, yeah. But his that whole scene it was so good, like because it's just a total shift in character for him as well. Because he's I used just to the go, storyteller. I used to go to your church all the time. Now a lot of things have changed. <laughs> it was so good. I also give props to full, like full shot of someone sawing their stuff off. Because, uh, yeah, I, I want to know if directors are ever gonna full send it because they like to do it off screen. I'm like, are you gonna fucking full send it, bro? Dog, this ain't saw. And when they full send it, it makes me happy. Because I'm like, oh, they're going to make some people squirm with that. Also, his fucking arm is disgusting, dude. It's like, yeah, they did a good job of showing you the like f the eventual degradation of his fucking arm. And you're just like, oh, this is awful. But yeah, that was my favorite scene. I feel this is like an Evil Dead 2 reference because like corruption yeah. through the hand right. and stuff like that. So it's like a it's like a fun little like, hey, I like that movie. Dude, that, <laughs> the, the guy who, who plays the laundromat owner... Uh, Coleman Domingo, he's in a lot of stuff, like a ridiculous amount of TV shows uh, and quite a few movies, always as a secondary character. Yeah, I, I believe he's like, he does a lot of voice acting. Yeah, he's done a lot of voice acting, which is pretty cool. So the voice is probably familiar. You probably heard it in like a, a animation or something. Yeah. Um, what, I think my favorite scene has to be the, the ending one. Uh, you get a, a, a voice alteration that happens with... Uh, Anthony's character who then turns into the candy man and then you get the idea that he's sort of not alone that it's sort of a culmination of all of them when you see Tony Todd's version of it and I'm so glad that they gave him the final line of the movie because you're just like this is such a great like respectable like <laughs> pay your respects to whoever created this character and it's him like he's kind of represented that character for such a long time and so to bring him into the film is is really cool that they did that instead of like taking him completely out of it and like making something new 
And so, so, yeah. Shout out to the ending credits. Sit in your seat for that one. Yeah. Yeah. uh, I don't know why so many people left. Uh, I think they didn't realize what the story was going to be. I pity them. (laughs) It was so good. You get a, you get a, 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 a last puppet show that kind of explains more about the lore and you definitely should sit and watch the rest of it. You see all three or four generations of Candyman. Yeah, it kind of gives you the idea of like, how did this happen? Why did it keep happening? And then, and then they you end see it. with the giant shot of like the, the four Candymen. Yes. And then you just see shadows of hundreds of them behind them. Yeah, I think it's, like, it's obviously going to continue. Um, and I, I do wonder if they will make anything else, but I feel like this is this should be like kind of the end of it. Like, this is, like, a really good spot to kind of stop it. I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Because <laughs> it's going to be tough to – it would be really tough to make this yeah. continue because then you kind of might have, like, kind of pigeonholed yourself. Right. Because you're kind of, like, in the same – okay, then her baby becomes – Yeah, and then and you – That's yeah. kind of where I would see them going with it. But I'm like, but then you're just kind of doing Then again, the they could wait thing, as yeah. much time as they did for this yeah, one and then make Do another alive. generation. Yes, exactly. Man, yeah. yeah, I was about to say because I feel like – I had mentioned before, Candyman is very political. Yes. And the way they did this movie definitely alludes to a lot of the things that we talk about nowadays as far as the political. And so, you know, everything's obviously changing all the time. And in a few years, you're probably going to have a really good story to then transfer into this Candyman universe. True. That's actually a good point. I feel like that would end up working really well for it. Um, Do we have final scores then? Nine out of ten. Would you rate it? Yeah. Oh, dang. Okay. Yeah, also, Great I'm fucking gonna, I'm, movie. Yeah, not nine out of ten. Also, I would say, yeah, 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 that's perfect. It's really close to a ten, though. It is it's really, close. really yeah, close. it's like a nine point seven for me. Yeah, honestly. right. Yeah, <laughs> nine point two. <laughs> nine point yeah. two. Yeah, I'm somewhere in the nine point something range. <laughs> it's it still cements the fact that like Candyman is my favorite quote unquote slasher. Nice. Yeah. And. There's, there, that could probably be psychoanalyzed, but we don't have Dorian here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like like the original movie had done, it subverts a lot of what you expected out of a slasher film. Most slasher films, they kill indiscriminately and do not care who it is in front of them. They're usually just going to kill whoever's close to them. In this case, there's rules. And people love rules in their horror films. It sort of gives you the idea that you could survive it. And then you have the idea of like, ah, oh, there's people who are going to survive to the end. There's final girls. There's things like that. So it just plays into what people already love about horror films. And it does it in a different way than what you expect it. So I do. I would also give it like a 9, 9.5. I think the only reason I kind of took off just a little bit of it, and they do make fun of themselves for it, but I do feel like at some points their political commentary was a little too on the nose. They were like, they we've, we've heard it before, and it could be something that they maybe – should keep talking about, but it was a little too obvious. Too, I think too many breaks from action. Also, too there yeah, was a. Kind of, there, well, yeah. I think that's what you're kind of getting out. Of right. Bit, yeah, it kind know. of took me out of whatever they were talking about. Like, say when he was talking with the critic. Yeah, exactly. And you have this weird like meta moment where they're sort of making fun of themselves because they've created this moment in their own movie <laughs> and the, where they're talking about these things. So like they sort of knew it, and I think that was sort of the limit of where they pushed it to. Regardless, really good movie. And uh, it seems that everybody loves it. It's a huge fan favorite. Anytime, any review I've seen from people went to see it, love it. And even the critics now are starting to bring in their commentary and they really liked it. Tony motherfucking Todd. Tony Hell motherfucking yeah. Todd. Yeah, check out his voice acting work. He does some good shit. He does really good stuff. He's go, scary. go look at his Instagram. <laughs> he's, he's very scary. All right. Grab your coats. All right, let's Preferably walk out. Preferably of the tan variety this time. I Make do have sure co- you got your hooks. Yeah. And your hooks. Grab your hooks. <laughs> Get your razor blade candies. Your Jeez. razor blade candies. All right, we're ready to All right, go. Yeah, yeah. Let's de-gentrify this neighborhood, folks. <laughs> wait a second. Wait, wait. We're killing <laughs> cops now. All right, Mitch, but you're killing the cops, all right? Okay. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I love how he's like, okay. <laughs> no, There's don't a chance they won't shoot you as oh fast if it's you doing it. Yeah. They won't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, did that yeah. white man just attack a cop? No, it must have been that Shit. black person all the way over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, before we walk out, this reminded me of that fucking TV series Woke a little bit. <laughs> it's, yeah. It really did. There were some direct parallels to that. but uh, That's fair enough. It also makes me think of, uh, I don't know, I think it's a meme or a television show where they're like, what are you doing? Guy pulls out a gun, walks outside, and shoots into the air like three times. He's uh, like, are you fucking crazy? He's got to keep the rent down. And then he comes back <laughs> in. And he's like, oh, my God. Yeah, all around. <laughs> That's great. I love it. It sounds like a shameless thing. It It does sound like a shameless thing. (laughs) All right. So we got our shit. 
we're going to walk out. Thank you for listening to Bringing Down the Grindhouse, a podcast where we discuss horror and media. And first of all, check out our new fucking merch. Yeah. We're the chibi. We're anime. We're chibi. We look adorable. They're on cups. They're on mugs. Not just a cup, Mer. Pint glass. Oh, okay. Pint glass. <laughs> Very specific. Shout out to the artist that made the design. Yes, thank yes. you so much. If you have an Instagram, go check out My Halo is Prada. They are a photographer, but they also do artists or artistry as well. They make paintings. Obviously, they made our shirt, which is super cute. It's adorable. Go give them a look. Yeah. And then go check out our Patreon for, for $2 a month. You could check out all the bonus content as well as give us recommendations for movies or other pieces of horror media you want us to review also check us out on all our socials we have the facebooks the twitters and the instagrams uh leave us a comment let us know what you're thinking about these new episodes and uh make sure to subscribe to us or follow us whether it be on apple Podcasts or spotify and uh am i forgetting something you know i was gonna say one thing if you don't do any of that stuff that Mer just said Leave a rating. Also, yeah. yeah. We would appreciate that. Big thing. Yeah, Subscribe big, to big, us. Big thing. Leave a like. Uh, <laughs> this dis- ain't YouTube, but I know discuss, you can do that somewhere in some form. Discuss pit vipers with me. <laughs> Hit us yeah, up what on are our the best pit vipers? Yes. Tell us how much you love the podcast or how illiterate we are. Or how stoned we are. <laughs> or how much you hate the podcast. Well, we love that shit, too. But we would love to get some love. Everyone loves love. Yeah. But we accept hate with open arms. Yeah. Okay. Come we'll here, make you love we'll us. give you love. <laughs> all right, all right. So that's it. That's all I got. That's all our shit. Go check it out. Woo! I'm Mitch. I'm Mer. I'm Justine. And I'm Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>